Good afternoon, students, and welcome to episode 13B of Mind Altering Substances in the Ancient World. I'm your host, as usual, Dr. Rob Steffen. And today we're finally taking our feet out of the grapes, putting down our amphoras, and starting to raise our glasses full of Falernian red. That's right, it's time to start seeing how the Romans actually drank their wine. In the past two episodes, we've taken an in-depth look at the wine industry. From the growing of grapes to the storage and aging of wine, to the transportation of millions of liters across thousands of kilometers. Now we're going to see where all this wine ends up. In the bars of Rome, on the tables of both the rich and poor, even in the hands of soldiers and slaves. As we go through the drinking habits of the ancient Romans, consider the parallels and differences that exist between the role of wine in their society and in ours. And with that, let's open the bottle and start pouring out a nice glass of knowledge. One of the main takeaways from our lecture on distribution was the sheer amount of wine that was being transported across the Mediterranean. Roman historian David Potter suggests something like 100 million liters of wine was headed into Rome each year. And that's just one city in an empire that spans the entire Mediterranean Sea. And of course, if they're importing that much wine, it's because they're drinking that much wine. Most estimates suggest that the average Roman was drinking somewhere around one liter of wine per day. And to put that in perspective, a modern bottle of wine has only about three quarters of a liter of wine. They were housing it. So how in the world do you become the greatest empire the world has ever seen if everyone in the empire is drowning themselves in wine? Well, to answer that question, it's important to realize that much of Roman wine culture was borrowed from the Greeks. In its earliest days, Romans weren't all that into wine. But as we move towards the latter part of the Republic and the Roman Empire, wine started to play a major role in social, religious, and medicinal life, just like that in ancient Greece. And one of the major practices the Romans borrowed from the Greeks was the process of diluting their wine. Roman wine started out generally more alcoholic than our modern version, something like 16% instead of maybe 13%. Romans, just like the Greeks, mixed their wine with water to lower the alcohol content and to prevent, or at least slow down, drunkenness. There'd be something like three parts water for every one part wine. So the final product, alcohol-wise, would be something more akin to a beer today, maybe four or five percent alcohol. We can see this process of mixing wine both in the archeological record and in the historical record. Archeologically, we have sculptural reliefs that show the process of wine being poured from an amphora into a crater to be mixed with water. We also have the craters themselves that would have been used for such purposes. In the textual record, the author Diodorus Siculus describes how the Gauls, considered by barbarians by the Romans, drank wine unmixed, implying both that this was a characteristic of barbarians, but also that Romans usually did mix their wine. Even though Romans liked to belittle foreigners for drinking their wine unmixed, it wasn't all that infrequent in Rome to drink wine straight. This appears to be especially true at the taverns and bars that line the streets of most Roman cities. We have graffiti from Pompeii where someone complains about how the bartender is diluting wine way, way too much. It says, May cheating like this trip you up, bartender. You sell water and yourself drink undiluted wine. Just like going to the bar today, when your gin and tonic is all tonic, no gin. Nobody likes watered down drinks. We're going to talk more about bars in our next episode, but for now, realize that these were common popular establishments that lined the streets of most Roman cities and towns. Pompeii gives us our best evidence, and that small town had something in the range of about 200 bars. You can tell the buildings at Pompeii are bars because, wait for it, they have a giant bar that opens up onto the street. Doesn't take Albert Einstein of archeologist to figure that one out. Anyway, most of these places would have served cheap wine and snacks. Some would have had hot food. Still others would have had gambling and prostitutes and rooms to sleep uh, for the night. Truly kind of a one-stop shop for all your favorite vices. And because these associations with gambling and prostitutes, the bars would have been primarily a place uh, for the lower class people to eat and drink and be merry. Just because it was the lower classes who hung out at the bars didn't mean that the aristocracy of Rome wasn't having their fair share of wine, women, and fun. We've already talked about the Greek symposium in depth, and the Romans had a similar type of social get-together known as a convivium. 
While symposium literally means drinking together, the Latin word convivium literally means living together. Don't worry though, they were still doing plenty of drinking too. Like the symposium, the convivium took place at the residence of an elite member of Roman society. Roman houses were similar to Greek houses in that they had specially differentiated space in open air areas. In Greek houses, the symposium took place in the andron, literally the man's room. Roman houses, however, were designed a little differently. Most Roman houses were centered on an area known as the atrium, an open area that served to connect other specialized parts of the house. In the middle of the atrium was a small pool, the impluvium, which ran uh, into which rainwater could fall through an opening in the ceiling, known as the compluvium. The atrium would have been a fairly public part of the house, where friends, family, and clients of the head of the household, known in Latin as the pater familius, could have mingled while awaiting their business with the boss. Located around the atrium were a variety of room types. Some of these rooms were known as cubicula, the Latin word for bedrooms. These obviously would have been fairly private spaces closed off to guests. The tablinum, basically the office of the pater familius, often stood at the rear of the atrium, and from here he'd call clients and partners in to address business concerns. Behind the atrium was usually the peristyle, a colonnaded courtyard used to allow light and air into the home as well as to provide a like, kind of a nice place uh, for the family to walk around at their leisure and enjoy the nice weather. And then finally, there was the triclinium, the most important room for our discussion today. That was also located at the side uh, of the atrium or behind the garden. Very literally, the triclinium means the three couch room. And much like the andron of Greek houses, couches lined the walls of the triclinium. It was here that guests would recline to sip wine and nibble on food. The couches formed a U shape and in the middle of the U was a large table that would have held all the food for a feast larger than the one you're looking at here. Like the Androne, the Triclinium was often richly decorated with frescoed walls and mosaic floors. In Triclinia were more than just couches though. Tables would be set up, uh, intricately uh, decorated amphorae and craters could be found throughout the room, and marble and bronze statues would add to the lav lavish kind of aesthetic. Uh, so you can kind of think of something like a banquet hall more than just a dining room. And here within the Triclinium, the Convivium would go down. The Roman banquet tended to be a little bit more bombastic, a little bit more extra than the Greek symposium. Instead of munching on a charcuterie, the food at a convivium was exotic and luxurious. There would usually be at least three courses. Appetizers, known as the gustatio in Latin, the main course, the mensae primae in Latin, and the dessert, the mensae secundae in Latin. And just like the convivium as a whole, the food was just as much about impressing the guests as it was about filling their bellies. Aristocratic hosts would often try to provide exotic wild animals, fish, and birds in order to impress their guests with the rarity and high cost of the ingredients. Basically, it was just as much about showing off the host's wealth as it was about getting together to eat and drink. And here you can see in this kind of 5th century mosaic, this really cool thing that we call the, the unswept, unswept floor style of mosaic, where what they've done is actually build in the kind of uh, detritus from a convivium into the floor of the mosaic. And so you can see bones, uh, fish bones, shellfish, uh, the kind of trash from the, the end of a party like this on the floor itself. Kind of a really bizarre and weird kind of way to, to do a mosaic. Those rare foods could be pheasants or songbirds, shellfish like oysters and lobsters, and even things we don't think of as food today, like eels or peacocks. And here we see another one of these unswept floor mosaics with all sorts of like shellfish, snails, lobster tails, crab legs. Uh, we can even see a little mouse built into the mosaic eating a walnut down there. And if you pay attention to the detail, you can actually see shadows on all these things as well. Pretty crazy the level of detail here. Uh, sometimes the presentation of the food was as crazy as the food itself. And in Petronius's Satyricon during Trimalchio's dinner, he stuffs roasted pig with sausages and as it adds wings to make a rabbit look like Pegasus, the flying horse of Greek mythology. And while this was probably a little over the top when compared to the normal convivium, it does seem safe to conclude that the food aspect of the Roman convivium was, little, was like a little more robust than that of the Greek symposium. Ma come 
invece non l'avete nemmeno sventrato. E me lo portate così, in codo, chiamatemi. L'hai cotto in vero, non l'hai aperto. Pietà, mio signore, pietà. Pegatelo e frustatelo. Ho sbagliato, ho sbagliato, ma abbi pietà. Allora che aspetti, disgraziato? Sventralo qua, adesso. Oh, meraviglia! I torti! Gallini ingrassati, ventrici d'uccelli, colori salciccia, palombe più tenere! Chiocciola, pico di cappucciata, prosciutto, coratella, rimalcione! <laughs> Wine was just as big a part of the Roman convivium as it was of the Greek symposium. And as we've mentioned, Romans mixed their wine as well. Unlike the symposium, however, it was usually individually mixed for each attendee. They'd ladle out the unmixed wine into their cup, then mix in whatever they'd like, sometimes boiled water, other times ice, other times regular water, other times spices or honey. We've already talked about some of the different types of wine. Laura and Mulsum at the bottom end of the spectrum, and Satinum and Caicuban and Album and Falernium at the upper end of the spectrum. And naturally, the finest wine a family could afford would be served at the convivium in order to impress their guests. The wine would have been drunk out of specialized wine cups, just like the Greeks used the Kylix. In Rome, two other Greek forms, the Skifos and the Cantharos, remain popular. The Skifos, that you see here, was a short kind of deep wine cup with two handles, while the Cantharos was a similar kind of deep wine cup uh, with two large handles that could stand on a, uh, a stem, so we see it raised off the ground. And it was just as important that the cups, utensils, and decorations were as impressive as the food. Most wealthy homes would have had a literal set of silverware. That was, you know, silver utensils and plates and, and cups and things like that, to go along with silver serving trays um, and everything you would need to put on a nice dinner. The wealthiest families would have had silver cups with ornate reliefs, often relating to Bacchus, the Roman god of wine. You can probably guess at this point what I'll say about the entertainment. Just like the wine, just like the food, just like the utensils, just like the decorations, the entertainment was an important way that Roman aristocrats could impress and gain status amongst their friends. There could be singers or dancers or poets. There could be historical recreations or performing animals or acrobats. Whatever the host thought would entertain and leave a good impression on his guests. One final big difference with the symposium. Uh, the convivium wasn't limited just to elite men. Elite women could attend as well, and sometimes even the children of the household would attend, giving them a chance to learn how to become respectable men within elite Roman society. Even those of the lower classes were sometimes invited to join uh, the elite at a convivium. And this gets back to Roman social structure, which was built in part around what's known as patron-client relationships. And here, uh, the patron would help out the, the kind of poorer people by providing money or jobs or favors to those clients. And then the poorer people, the clients themselves, uh, who took advantage of those favors, would in return kind of vote the way the patron wanted, they would support the patron out in public, and then they'd join the patron at a party like this, kind of both as a reward to themselves, um, but also as a way to show off the, the number of friends that the, the patron had. And so you can see that just like the symposium, the convivium was more than just a party to get sloshed on wine at. It was an important aristocratic institution that built social bonds among the elite and gave them an opportunity to impress their peers and win status among them. It was a time to pull out all the stops to show off to your friends. And even though you're strength strengthening your relationship with them, you're also ideally trying to outdo them with the lavishness of your party. Now, obviously not everyone had the means nor the status to put on elaborate convivia. Nonetheless, they still had plenty of drink, often with their lunch and dinner at home uh, or out at the bars. At home, less wealthy families would have had a similar set of utensils and tableware, but they would have been made out of cheaper materials, most often ceramics, rather than the black and orange painted pottery of ancient Greece or the kind of fine silverware of ancient Rome. Roman ceramic fineware was a deep red color, kind of an orangish red like you see here. This was known as terra sigillata, or very literally stamped earth. And this form of pottery produced a shiny red color because of the very high temperature 
at which it was fired at in the kilns. Firing at that high temperature made it become semi-vitrified, almost semi-liquefied, and that's what gives it the shine that you see here. The fact that the decoration was stamped rather than painted was also classically kind of Roman. You can imagine how much more efficient this was than painting everything by hand. And indeed, in the provinces, especially in Gaul, it nearly grew, the production of this type of pottery nearly grew to the levels of mass production. And so see, here you can see kind of a huge kiln from La Grofezonc in France, uh, where terra sigillata was essentially mass produced. At nearly all meals, regardless of status, wine would have been present. And this was only in part because people enjoyed it. Wine was also served as a way to reduce bacteria that could commonly be found in the untreated water of the time. Somewhat amazingly, even slaves were expected to take part in the drinking of wine. Cato the Elder suggests that slaves should get about five liters of wine per week. That's about seven bottles of modern wine, one a day. Even though he justifies this by saying it was more for their health rather than for kind of their happiness. I imagine it helped with both. Remember that uh, slaves probably drank a type of wine called Laura, a wine-like beverage made from the third pressing of grape skins, the final pressing of grape skins, along with the stems. Certainly the lowest type of wine we know from the Roman world. Women were also allowed to drink wine, somewhat more freely than in ancient Greek society. Although it was frowned upon for them to get wicked drunk, we do have evidence in comedies and satires where women hit the bottle pretty hard. The poet Juvenal talks about how Venus, goddess of love, can't tell her head from, well, um, her reproductive parts when she's drunk. And I imagine a lot of people, both men and women, might be accused of that today. Soldiers, too, got in on the heavy drinking ways. They were allotted between a half liter and a liter of wine per day, and this was thought to help them both physically and mentally. Who wants to get in a fight with a bunch of drunken Roman soldiers? I'll, I'll pass on that one. And if you think that uh, at any given time that there were probably around four legions in the province of Gaul, right, about 20,000, 24,000 soldiers, uh, that's a lot of wine per day, right? So thousands of liters of wine per day. You can get the sense for how the Roman state, through the military, helped spur the wine production and distribution industries. Wine was also inextricably bound to religion and ritual in, ancient Roman, in the ancient Roman world. Many of us have heard of the Greek wine god Dionysus and his Roman counterpart Bacchus. But the link between religion and wine goes far beyond that in ancient Rome. We'll dive into this more in a future lecture. But for now, realize that wine was often a centerpiece of religious fe festivals, both for common consumption, but also for official sacrifice to the gods being honored. Moreover, wine was commonly linked to the idea of rebirth. If you think about vines, right, kind of being born in the spring and then kind of dying in the fall as they're harvested, going through winter and then being reborn in the, the, the next spring, you can kind of get to see how this idea of rebirth is linked to it. Bacchus himself is frequently associated with ideas of life after death through this kind of um, link to rebirth. And most of us are familiar with the ritual involving wine in Christianity, namely the drinking of wine, which symbolizes, or perhaps actually is, depending on your personal set of beliefs, the blood of Jesus, who also is strongly associated with life after death. We also see wine playing a role in medicine in the ancient Roman world. Some of its uses seem to make enough sense. So Galen, the guy we talked about when, uh, in our lecture on ancient Greek medicine, used wine as both an antiseptic, that is like something that sterilizes things, and an analgesic, that is a pain reliever. And kind of with its relatively high alcohol content, wine would have made sense for both of those purposes. Other uses are kind of a bit more, say, odd. Uh, so one recipe used wine as a laxative by mixing it with manure and ashes and another plant. I'll go ahead and say hard pass on that one. Uh, another recipe had wine kind of um, soaking, it had juniper and myrtle, kind of two plants soaking in wine, and then they used that to kind of cure snake bites somehow. I think probably drinking the wine would have helped a little bit more than that, but that's up to them. Uh, still other uses uh, could be related to helping to cure mental uh, disorders like depression and physical problems like gout or bloating. So Romans kind of truly thought that Rome was indeed the solution to all of life's problems. To alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. But like Homer said, it wasn't just the solution to all of life's problems. 
wine could also be the cause of all of life's problems. Despite frequently drinking to excess, the Romans generally frowned upon this practice. They thought it brought on madness, Lucretius calling it the fury in one's soul. Seneca, the owner of a vineyard, believed that wine magnified the problems you already had in your life, both physical and mental. Uh, and this seems fairly similar to kind of Pliny the Elder's proclamation that, indeed, in vino veritas, in wine, there is truth. Basically, you reveal who you truly are when you're drinking wine. On the whole, we can see that wine was somewhat of a democratizing beverage, basically something that made people more equal. And although there were different types of wine, the beverage was available to people regardless of class or gender. Women and men, slave and free, rich and poor, could all take part in the drinking of wine. And when combine that cultural approach with the fact that it was fairly diluted and the fact that it helped purify the water, it starts to make sense to see how Romans were able to drink about a liter of wine a day. So next time you polish off a bottle by yourself, remember that you still need another third of a bottle to hit your uh, Roman allotment. Although, also remember that theirs was very, very watered down. Uh, if each person was drinking a liter a day, this means that in the aggregate, people across the Roman Empire were drinking hundreds of millions of liters of wine per year. Rather impressive, if you ask me. Uh, with wine being tied to social relationships and religious ritual and military service and health and well-being, it's at least a little easier to understand how these massive quantities were consumed. And it's easier to get a sense for how a simple beverage played a huge role in molding Roman society the way it was. As we move forward, we'll look in wine two uh, more particular kind of contexts. First, we're going to take a trip to the neighborhood bar for, you know, not a glass, but maybe a pint of wine. Then we'll dive into the nuances of the relationship between wine and religion, both in ancient Rome, but also in a budding religion in the late Roman Empire that we now know as Christianity. So stay tuned. Drink up our next glass of mind-altering substances in the ancient world.